3, 1. We are now out of chapter 2 and on our way to the third chapter. And while you turn there, I'll summarize. 21. In verse 19, uh, we see that Paul had stated that through the law, he died to the law. And we stated that this is a reference to the law's purpose being to reveal our sin nature as the existence of the law provides an outlet through which our sin nature manifests and thus becomes visible to us. And that in and of itself is uh, worthy of its own study. But we also learn that the law makes our sin worse in the sense that it increases the frequency of sin as it provides specific items for our sin nature to go against. And it also makes sin deliberate, since sin goes from being in the conscience to being in the mind. And as such, Paul dies to the law because the law tells him that he cannot meet its demands, which in turn forces him to flee to Christ for salvation, since it's insanity to try to be saved through the very thing that we broke. And then in verse 20, Paul indicates that he locates his death to the law in the death of Christ. And that because he is dead to the law, he is now alive in Christ and lives the Christian life by faith in the redemptive work of Christ. And then in verse 21, he concludes that because he looks to his salvation in Christ... He does not nullify the grace of God because this view is the only view that allows Christ's death to actually have meaning. Because if we were still bound to Judaism and its system, then the death of Christ had no legitimate purpose and did not accomplish anything for us on a spiritual or practical level. And so today we'll cover verses 1 through 6 or 1 through 5, seeing how time goes, uh, of Galatians 3. And I'll read from verses 1 through 6 for context for us here. And so in verse 1, Paul begins this chapter by saying, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So in that there, but... As we transition to this third chapter in Galatians, you'll notice that verses 1 through 6 is really a string of rhetorical questions. He's asking questions over and over again. And so the point here, of course, of questions is that it causes the reader to think. That's why teachers ask so many questions to students, because it forces them to think through the problem themselves. And it's to lead them through Uh, lead them to truth rather than just telling them so that they understand the why behind truth. And so that's what Paul is doing. And he begins with a rhetorical question here in verse 1. And he asks the Galatians who has bewitched them. And the word bewitched comes out of the Greek word baskaino, which from its own derivative root means to cast an evil spell over somebody. So to cast, them, to cast them into some kind of illusion. And the idea of the word really is that an evil sorcerer or witch cast an evil spell over somebody to make them deluded into believing what they believe. And of course here, the reason Paul is using it is because it's hyperbolic language, which Paul loves hyperbole. And Paul does not really mean that they have a spell cast over them But rather, it's that their beliefs are so foolish, it is as if they could not be this foolish unless they were under some kind of spell. Because to Paul, no normal, rational, reasoning Christian would think how these Galatians are thinking. 
And as a matter of fact, the word for foolish here, which is or the word translated as foolish in our English text, when Paul describes them as foolish Galatians, it does actually mean that. It is the Greek word enotos, which means thoughtlessness. It, mean, it refers to somebody specifically who has not fully reasoned through an issue, who has not actually thought through a scenario fully. So he's saying that the Galatians have not fully examined the issue at hand, that the Galatians have not actually studied this, which is an interesting point with this word because the Greek language is generally more specific than, or precise than English. And so the, the word here for foolish is not like, um, if you'll excuse the expression, he's not calling them an idiot. He's not saying that they're, they don't have intelligence. The word that he's using is to refer to someone who hasn't thought through it. So he's saying that they're premature in their thinking. They haven't actually made the effort to think. They haven't actually studied it. And so, because the question here, or the point is that if they thought about it, and thought for just a moment about the fact that Christ died, then all they had to do was ask the question of why did he die? Because the question of why did he die should be sufficient to lead anybody away from Judaism. If you believe that Jesus of Nazareth truly was the Messiah, then you believe that he died. Then you ask the question, why did he die? Why did the Messiah die? That should be sufficient to lead anybody away from Judaism. And furthermore, it's not as if these Galatians didn't have access to any other source of information. So that's why I would agree that Paul's not really being too harsh here. And remember how Luther, in the, the beginning of Galatians, when Paul kind of gave them that uh, introductory condemnation, Luther said that Paul was being kind. Uh, he said that Paul's not really expressing anger at them so much as he is expressing disappointment, like a parent would when their children do something foolish. As in, he's not saying, it's not an expression of hatred, but rather an expression of sorrow. And also remember how, funnily enough, John Calvin believes Paul didn't go far enough with his rebukes. And so what is meriting Paul's response here, though? Why is he so peeved at the Galatians for what they're doing? Well, because they have more than one place to obtain information. They've not fully thought through the issue, it's not as if they're limited to what the Judaizers are telling them and that they're purely dependent on the Judaizers for their knowledge of the scriptures. It's not like the Judaizers were the very first people they heard proclaim something about theology because the Galatians have the Old Testament scriptures. They also had the Septuagint. The Septuagint was well in circulation at this point in time. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So that means that if you're uh, in Greece, you very well probably do not speak Hebrew at all, and you don't read Hebrew. And so you need a Bible, a copy of the Old Testament that is written in your language in order to understand it. And that was exactly what they had. They had the Septuagint, which was written in the Koine Greek, the common language of the people during that time. And so they did have access to that. And as a matter of fact, Jesus himself quotes from the Septuagint, and Paul even used it in his writings. So it's well in circulation. And so therefore, if the Galatians had actually spent time reading the scriptures, they would have known the purpose of the law. That's the rebuke Jesus constantly accuses the Pharisees of. Like, you have access to these scrolls. You have access to all of these resources, and yet you still don't understand the basic fundamentals of Christianity. And so that's especially damning for the Jews, because the Jews, especially the Jews who are in, not the Judaizers here in the, uh, in the city, but the natural Jews who were in Galatia at that time, the Jews were experts in the Old Testament. And so for the Jews, there was definitely no excuse. And to show them that there is sufficient data in the Old Testament to glean the truth of the purpose of the law from, Paul will actually quote from the Old Testament. And he will reason from it later in this chapter. And that's where Paul is going to withdraw the majority of his arguments from, if not all of his arguments. And, and he does the same thing in Romans as well. That Paul repeatedly uses the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and to prove the purpose of the law and to prove um, the, the Christian, quote-unquote, doctrine of salvation. 
to show that it's perfectly sufficient, that the Old Testament is perfectly sufficient to find that information. And so that's why he is so upset, because it's like if you just read this thing and you studied it, then you would see. But here we may also notice the rather stark contrast between the Galatians and the Bereans. Because if you compare Paul's rebuke of the Galatians in Galatians 3.1, and even at the, the beginning of Galatians, if you compare that with Luke's description of the Bereans in Acts 17.11, and I'll just read that for you. Um, in Acts 17.11, Luke says, Now these Jews, who are the, the Bereans, the Berean Jews, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So the idea is that Paul went to Berea. They were preaching the gospel. They were preaching in the synagogues. And what the, these Berean Jews were doing, they were examining the scriptures. Which scriptures? Well, the Old Testament. They were examining their Old Testament scriptures daily to see if what Paul and the other apostles and the other evangelists there were, to see if what they were proclaiming was actually true. And if the scriptures actually did say that. And here Luke refers to the Bereans as noble for studying and reading the scriptures. When Paul was reasoning with them about the gospel. But Paul refers to the Galatians as foolish. So the Bereans took what Paul told them and then they dove into the Old Testament writings to make sure that what he was telling them was correct. They examined the scriptures. They compared each verse and they, the Bereans thought through it. And they reasoned through it. And Luke tells us they didn't just study the scriptures weekly, but daily. So for the Bereans, this wasn't a weekly thing, as in we get together one day a week and we decide to read the scriptures on this one day. This was a daily activity for these Bereans. They, so they didn't take what Paul said at face value. And Paul was an apostle. And so did Paul get mad at the Bereans for studying the scriptures? Did he say, why are you reading this? Why are you reading the scriptures? Do you not trust me? I'm telling you what's true. Do you not value what I say? Do you not, am I not respectable enough for you as an apostle? You don't need those writings of the prophets. Just listen to me instead. But no, he didn't say those things. He didn't get mad. Instead, the Bereans were complimented. And they were held in high regard because they examined the words that Paul said and compared them to the biblical text. And that's the, that's the key. Paul, Luke, the evangelists, they didn't get mad at the Bereans when they were studying the scriptures and examining their words because studying the scriptures is what they wanted. They wanted to see their, uh, their congregation studying the word. That's exactly why they came. They're wanting to see that. They're wanting to see that activity. So they complimented them because that's exactly what they want. We want to see people studying the word of God, and we want to see you comparing what we're saying with what the scriptures teach. And so the Galatians, on the other hand, clearly they did no such thing. When the Judaizers came down and they told them X, Y, Z, they told them such and such, they told them that you had to be saved through the law, that you had to have some kind of legitimate disassociation between Jews and Gentiles and all of these other things, the Galatians clearly did not study that. They did not dive into the word of God. They did not read. They did not compare. They did not listen. And that's evidenced by the fact that Paul would begin quoting to them from the scriptures to prove his point. And another point, though, about this contrast between the Bereans and Galatians is it helps us understand the nature of false teachers. Because false teachers don't want you reading the scriptures. They don't want you diving into them and truly examining them. And they especially don't want you to compare what they're saying to the scriptures and having you test the words they say to you by holding them up to the light of the word of God. The Roman Catholic Church is case in point in this. It took hundreds of years and thousands of martyrs just to get the Bible written in the language of the common people. And why is that? 
Because if more people had access to the Bible in their own language, then they'd know that the Roman Catholic Church was lying about what the Bible said. And likewise, Marcion, who's one of the earliest heretics in church history, ripped out all the pages in the Bible that reference the wrath of God or anything close to it because he didn't want people reading that. Cult leaders also usually forbid you to read the Bible or certain sections of it as well. And I have a family member going through something very similar in which the religious organization they're a part of is discouraging strong examination of God's word. And so it's usually a mark of a false teacher to do that. And that's why it is so important that when we look at Paul, he's getting mad at the Galatians for not doing that, for not reading the Bible. And, he, and in, uh, in Acts, they were very happy with the Bereans because they were studying. But also don't de- be deceived because teachers d- don't have to do it just by commission. They can do it by omission. And what I mean by that is that false teachers don't have to openly discourage you from reading the scriptures. Because in today's time, it is rare that you will hear a pastor, even a false teacher, specifically say, don't read your Bible. I don't want you to even have one in your house. Never open it. Never study it. Never. Because you're never going to really hear Joel Osteen say that. You're never going to hear Ken Copeland or Benny Hinn say that. Instead, this discouragement of studying the word is usually masked under the practice of not actively encouraging people to study it. So while it may be a rare thing to hear a pastor say to not read your Bible, it is also a rare thing to hear a pastor talk about the importance of actively studying it. It is rare to hear a preacher stand up and talk about how his congregation ought to be reading their Bibles daily and digging into it and getting good study Bibles and commentaries and reading it page to page, cover to cover. And the discouragement to read the Bible is also manifest by the worship songs that are chosen to be sung because generally they don't have any biblical basis. And churches also sometimes do not have legitimate corporate prayer. There are not Bible readings, and when there is a sermon preached, perhaps maybe only one or two verses of Scripture are used, and they're talked about in the sermon for maybe just a few minutes, and then the rest of the sermon is just just 30 minutes of personal anecdotes, life stories, and vague monologues on ethics or self-help or motivational speaking. And so while false teachers may not tell their congregation to not read the Bible, The practices in their churches of hardly ever opening a Bible for anything sends a clear message to the congregation that reading the scriptures is not important. And so they discourage Bible reading and Bible study by not setting good examples of actively reading the scriptures. And conversely, a God-fearing church will not just proclaim to you the importance of daily studying and reading the scriptures, but they will do it themselves. And this is not to speak highly of, uh, of ourselves here at Faith Baptist at all, as we obviously are not the only church who's like this. But this is why we strive to make the scriptures the center of all we do. We read the Bible before we pray in corporate prayer. We just did that this morning. And we reference the scriptures when we pray. Before our morning Bible study, we say a catechism like we also just did, which is a summary of biblical truth. We have a scripture read before we sing the hymns, and then we sing the hymns, which are biblically based, and are summaries of scriptural truth. And then we have a sermon, which is the exposition of scripture. And as of last Sunday, we're also studying the scriptures or their truths as summarized in the London Baptist Confession of Faith in our afternoon services. So it's scripture, 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 over and over again. We hear the Bible. We pray the Bible, we speak the Bible, we read the Bible, we sing the Bible, and we learn the Bible. And we do these things because the scriptures are truth. In the Bible, we find the things of God. 
and we find how to be pleasing to him, and we are constantly led to him. And reading the Bible is how we ensure that we as men are not just up here flapping our mouths, just saying stuff. It is what helps ensure it is God speaking through us. Because you don't wake up early on a Sunday and sacrifice the physical pleasures that of life that you could otherwise be enjoying and drive to church just to hear some man talk. You come to church to hear God. You come to church to hear the word of God. And the way that you stop a church service from being about man is by saturating it in God's word. And because we have nothing to hide here, just like Paul has nothing to hide. He wants the Bereans to study the scriptures. He has nothing to hide. Because we want the word of God known and we want the word of God taught. And that is the, the entire point here. And, and the reason that we, I bring that up is because clearly this was something that was not occurring in the Galatian church. Because all it took, if, a couple, if all it took to disrupt the entire concept of salvation to these Galatians was just a couple of Judaizers just a couple of punks coming down from Jerusalem and just a couple of days, now the entire congregation is just clueless when it comes to salvation. That's all it took. That shows you what kind of lifestyle and what kind of services they were already having. Because this was not something that was done in a vacuum. This was not something that the Judaizers just had to come down and they were able to spend years and years brainwashing the congregation. The fact that the Judaizers were able to so successfully sway the Galatians so quickly shows us, that, uh, shows us the pre-existing structure in the church to begin with. It shows us that their minds were not already saturated in the word of God. And that's why Paul calls the Galatian church foolish. Because the church there was not saturated in God's word. They were not studying it. They were not applying it. The word of God was not central to them. They allowed themselves to be carried away from God's word, the anchor that fastens us to God amidst all the thousands of errant views that are spewed out of the mouths of unregenerate men. And to bolster his point, Paul then reminds the church that before their eyes, probably not all of their eyes, but most likely before the Judaizers, but before their eyes, Christ was crucified. That's the next point that he brings up in, uh, in uh, Galatians 3.1. The Galatians know, because many were eyewitnesses, or if they weren't eyewitnesses, they heard the news, that Jesus, the Messiah, was legitimately made incarnate, crucified, resurrected, and ascended. The death of Jesus was not a private event. It was a public event. It's not like his death were a secret. There are some people who even today may, may think that uh, his death were a secret, and they may even question the validity of the death of Christ and even the existence of Christ at all, and even people within the uh, Christian denominations. Uh, Bertrand Russell, the renowned philosopher in his famous essay called Why I Am Not a Christian, also stated that it is highly improbable and highly questionable whether or not Jesus actually existed historically. And as history has progressed and we've obtained access to archaeological records and advancements, we now know that it is not the case, and we now know of at least seven secular historians from, which, uh, from when Jesus lived who speak of Jesus' existence and of the crucifixion. And the reason I say that is because while many arguments occur today about whether Jesus lived and was crucified, those arguments did not exist when Galatians was written. And that's Paul's point. The life, ministry, and crucifixion of Christ was a known event. And even if people didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they did believe he died because he was hung up on a cross for everybody to see. And Paul is reminding them now that they know that Christ died, that they know that Jesus lived, and they know that he died Connecting this with his prior point he made in verse 21 of chapter 2. In verse 21, Paul said that if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no no purpose. 
And now he turns around and says, and you know that Christ died. You know he died. So the logical cause then is that, if, is that righteousness is not through the law. If we take into consideration that Christ actually did die for a purpose, that if Christ died, then it would have been for a purpose, as that's what Paul's implying here with the, with the reasoning, then this works itself into a syllogism rather beautifully. So the logic goes like this. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Christ died. Therefore, righteousness is not through the law. So how can you, after seeing Christ be beaten, crushed, and killed, turn around and trust in something other than him for your salvation? That must have been a stinging blow to the Galatians when they read that. Because either they personally witnessed it, or they know of it, and they have heard the accounts of it. Because again, it was no question back then that Jesus died. Everybody knew he died. The only question at that point was whether or not he was the Messiah. And these Galatians did believe he was the Messiah. They were not, um, they were not atheistic. They were not Judaistic in the sense that they were, denying the, uh, they were not denying the Messiahship of Jesus. They believed that he was the Messiah. They were confused about salvation. And so that's the point that Paul's trying to make, that if he did die, then he died to bring you from under the law. And he's going to kind of lead them more through this logic in the next couple of verses. And so as we approach verse 2, this is where we really kind of get into those rhetorical questions that are designed to get the Galatians to think through this, and that are designed to help the Galatians think through this entire process. And so in verse 2, Paul asks the rhetorical question here to get them to reason. And so he asks, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So he's not handing them the answer like he did in the prior verses. He's, He's leading them to it. And this is also, I think, the question we ask ourselves. Did we receive the Spirit by works or by faith? How did we receive the Spirit? The book of Acts obviously teaches us all about that. In Acts 2, at Pentecost, you're familiar with the story. The Holy Spirit descended while the apostles were in prayer. And then subsequently, as the gospel is proclaimed throughout the the entire book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit descends and indwells those who hear it. In Acts 10.44 when Peter is proclaiming the gospel to Cornelius and the other Gentiles, in verse 44, Luke gives us a description of the event and says that while Peter was still saying these things, these things being the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. So what works did Cornelius do during that time period that Paul was preaching, to be saved. He just was listening. That's all he was doing. He was just standing there listening to what uh, Peter was, or, uh, yeah, what Peter was proclaiming. They were just listening to the words. And they were even uncircumcised. So they didn't do anything. Literally, they did nothing to merit that salvation. They didn't perform any work, and yet the Holy Spirit descends. The Holy Spirit indwells them. And while Peter proclaimed the gospel, the Spirit fell, and they believed in Christ. In Romans 4, and we're going to come back to this multiple times before we're done, but in Romans 4, Paul speaks about how Abraham received salvation through faith. And in verses 13 through 14 of Galatians 3, further down on your page there, Paul actually makes this statement. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, By becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. So in verse 14, 
of Galatians 3, Paul answers the question that he raised in verse 2. So the answer to Paul's question in Galatians 3, 2 is obviously no. We receive the Spirit through faith, just like everything else associated with salvation. Because think about all the many components of salvation there are. Soteriology is a big subject. There's regeneration, justification, glorification, indwelling of the Spirit, imputation, propitiation. Some people throw baptism under there. What have you. But which of those were earned through works? Not a single one. Not a single one. So why would you receive the Spirit through works, but everything else through faith? You wouldn't. You receive the Spirit through faith. But why is Paul asking that question at all? What's the point of this rhetorical question? What's he getting at? The logic of it is outlined for us in verse 3, because he asks another one here. In verse 3, Paul asks, Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So what Paul is asking here is, If we've received the Holy Spirit, are we continuing to live the Christian life by our flesh? If we received the Spirit when we became Christians, when we were regenerated, has the Holy Spirit just been asleep ever since? Because that's the other question. If we are still living the Christian life by our flesh, if we are still under the law, which means we are living the life by our flesh, if we're still under the law, then what in the world is the point of the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit basically a version of a deistic God in which he exists but really doesn't do anything? Of course that is absurd. The answer is no. The Holy Spirit regenerated us and continues to work in our lives to guide us and to mortify our flesh and sanctify us, further conforming us to the image of Christ and helping us obey God more and disobey him less. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul says that. He says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Thus, the Holy Spirit does not stop working in our lives right after he regenerates us and praise God for that. The answer to the question Paul raises in verse 3 is obvious and Paul knows it's obvious. And that's why he's asking it. He knows the Galatians know this answer. Because he's still leading them through the thought process. He's now made them remember that they received the Spirit by faith. And that the Spirit continues to sanctify them as they live their lives. And that the Spirit helps them in their obedience to God. And now in verse 4, Paul asks his next question. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if it was in vain, if indeed it was in vain. And here's where our English Bibles might be a little bit misleading and might derail the thought process a little bit if we don't look at the original language. So the word suffer in this verse comes out of the Greek word pashko, which actually just means to be acted upon. It contains no negative nor positive connotation with it. Um, Now the word suffer in English does carry a negative connotation. So that's why we, I want to step back and look at the Greek. Um, but the, uh, in the Greek language, that word posco, it is used for unfortunate circumstances and blessed happenstances or blessed circumstances as well. So it is objective and it really carries no connotation. And the best way to translate it into English is the word experience. So if you... When you think through this, just replace the word suffer there with experience. Just because in our English language, suffer carries kind of a negative emotional uh, content there. But um, So in verse 4, Paul's asking, did you experience so many things in vain? Well, what things? The things he just talked about in verses 2 through 3. Did you experience practical sanctification in vain? Did you experience regeneration in vain? Did you experience the indwelling power of the Spirit in vain? What was the point in being regenerated, obtaining a new nature, believing on the death of Christ, and being actively sanctified by the Spirit if the law saved you? 
As a matter of fact, what sense does it make to be gifted the Holy Spirit to help us in our sanctification if our works save us? If our works are empowered by the Holy Spirit, if it's actually God performing the works, if it's the Holy Spirit performing the works through us, then wouldn't that mean we can never be saved? We don't even have a chance? Because if my obedience to the law is what saves me, and I'm not getting that obedience credited by anybody, and if it's just me, then I don't want the Spirit to help me. Because I'm the one who needs to obey it, not the Spirit. And so I would be telling the Holy Spirit to leave me alone. Let me try to obey the law on my own so I have a chance of being saved. And that's what Paul's getting at and what the lunacy of the question is that he asks in verse 5. And not just that, but this is where all these rhetorical questions that Paul has been lead us. Because what is the point in all of these salvific processes if you are saved through the law? What is the point in anything in the Christian life if you're still saved through the law? Why do we do anything that we do? If salvation is through the law, then you might as well just sleep in tomorrow. Who cares if you have the Holy Spirit? You still can't perfectly obey God. So you still stand condemned. You might as well just give up now. There's no hope. If you've sinned one time, then you're doomed. And you have no chance of salvation. So why do you bother going to church? Why do you bother praying? Why do you bother reading your Bible? Why, why do you bother obeying God at all? And men, why do you bother leading your wives? Why do you bother leading your families? Just give up. You can't be saved. You broke the law at one point, so now why bother continuing? But do you see the absurdity in all of this? Why in the world would God have given us the Spirit if our actions saved us? It wouldn't help in terms of our salvation. But it would also mean he's giving the Spirit to unregenerate people. The Holy Spirit would be indwelling people who are not saved. But indeed, we obey God not as ones who don't have hope, but as people who have hope. Because remember Paul's words in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved." And then in verse 8 of that same chapter, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. So if you're here this morning, and if you are sad and miserable because you're not good enough, or if you're wondering whether you are good enough, and you're stressing out about it, the gospel enters the picture, and it says, yeah, you're not good enough. You're wicked, and you're evil. But that doesn't matter, because Christ is good for you. And this is why we labor in the Christian life, because we have hope. We have a guarantee of our salvation because of the finished work of Christ. We've not been given the Holy Spirit in vain. We've not been given all these various components of salvation for nothing. They've all been given to us for a legitimate functioning purpose. Therefore, we don't labor in vain. The things that we do are not worthless. The things that we do in this Christian life are for a purpose. They matter. And they are infinitely important. And so we don't labor in vain. And that is why, as men, we lead our families. 
That is why we proclaim the gospel to our wives and to our children. And that is why we proclaim the gospel at all. That is why we continue to strive in our Christian life. That is why we get up out of beds in the morning. This is why we read the scriptures. This is why we pray. This is why we take care of the sick. Why we invite people into our homes. Why we give to the poor and needy. This is why we look after widows and orphans in their time of need. Why we don't exchange evil for evil and why we love our enemies. Because our hope is an eternal hope. We have a guarantee of our salvation. We have an an eternal hope, an unwavering hope, an unending hope. And that's what leads Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 to say, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul tells us that the cause of us laboring is our promise of salvation. Our salvation leads us to obey God more and to labor for him more, so much more than legalism does. And this is what we talked about last Sunday, that those who are saved obey God because they want to be pleasing to him due to the great grace he has shown. Legalists don't adore God. If you're striving to work and to obey because you're trying to get something out of it, the work that you do is not going to be that good of quality. Legalists are not motivated to obey God as we truly understood the great, because they don't understand the grace that has been shown to them. And so may... We all remember that our Christian life and our labor is never in vain. So, husbands, leading your family, taking them to church, reading the word with them, praying with them and for them, engaging them spiritually, leading your wife, cherishing her, protecting her, providing and loving her, These things are not in vain. So persevere. Be immovable in those things and continue to do that. And wives, loving your husbands, submitting to his leadership, helping him, praying for him. These things are not in vain. Persevere in them. Be immovable. And parents, leading your children, praying for them, lifting them up before God, protecting them taking them to church, teaching them the gospel, those things are not in vain. Persevere, remain immovable. And for all of us, ministering to those around us, seeking a godly spouse, going to the mission field, getting an education so you can benefit the kingdom of God in a certain area of study, working hard and doing your best at your job to set an example of Christ through a Christian work ethic, all of these things are worthy and are not in vain. God didn't give us the Holy Spirit and salvation or any of these components of salvation for no purpose. He gave them to us for a purpose and for a reason. Our salvation and our hope is secure and it is guaranteed. And so may we continue to press forward in our obedience, press forward in our worship, and press forward in our love for God, keeping our eyes on our eternal hope and on our eternal prize, who is Jesus Christ, our eternal God. And I will close us today in prayer.